Hi, uh, it's my pleasure to chair the second session of the day. Um, our speakers are uh, Joe Adjanka, um, and Nashir wrote the Twitter handlers for the two speakers here. So the first talk is Individuals, Formal Power in Groups and Their Social Network Accuracy, a Situated Cognition Perspective. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much for the invitation. It's wonderful to be here. And what I'll be presenting today is uh, work that I've uh, done with, uh, with Josh Marino. Josh was a uh, student I was supervising his dissertation, and with Dan Brass and Steve Borgatti. And uh, what I hope that you see at the end of this is that it's in some ways very similar to what Andrea was just talking about. Uh, we're going to be talking about network accuracy in this. And if you think about it, a lot of times when uh, network uh, researchers show you a network, there's this objective view. Here are these nodes, here are the connections between them. And uh, there are a lot of connections just in a very small group. Uh, this is uh, just a normal production team, and, and you have a whole bunch of connections. This kind of brings up the issue of, well, how accurately do people actually see this network? Uh, so we take, in this work, a cognitive view of the network and uh, say, look, individuals are going to have differing perceptions of uh, this network. And uh, following Cracker, we're going to think of them as cognitive social structures. These are what these mental maps are what you're walking around with as you're navigating the social work. And <coughs> given these maps, we're going to expect that people make errors, and that, in fact, it's a very difficult task to figure out what's going on within a network, and so they're going to be very prone to error. And just to give you a sense uh, directly within the groups that we're studying, uh, you could think of a true network. So this is one of the groups above, and it's the friendship network at the top. And then uh, we asked everybody to tell us about what the network looked like. And the highest accuracy person, who is this person here, uh, produced that map. And the lowest accuracy person here produced a very different map. Uh, and you can see that even the highest accuracy person doesn't have a very accurate map of what's going on within the network. So think about you know, what this means for uh, a lot of the theories that we have about people being uh, agentic within these networks when uh, even the best, most accurate person isn't doing very well. I'm sorry, Jeff, can you take a clarification question? I'm Please. just wondering what a true network you know, What's the data for the true network? Right, so great, great question. We're going to come back to that. Uh, we're going to do it two different ways. One way is um, locally aggregated structure, so we're going to ask you, all right, Andrea, who are you friends with? And then we'll take that as, okay, that must be the truth. Then we're going to do it a different way, which is we're going to ask everybody uh, who's friends with whom. And if Andrea says she's not friends with, with you, but everybody else is saying, yes, in fact, you are, then we assign a probability that, in fact, there is a friendship there. So we're going to take two different ways of doing this. Um, so think about this. Even in a 25-person network, so one of our groups is 25 people, there are 600 potential relationships. And you can see that there's a huge amount of potential for that information overload. And if you're wrong, these errors can also have consequences for uh, how you're acting in the network. Because how you view the network ends up affecting, eventually, how you behave within the network. Uh, and we are going to be focusing here on understanding how your level in the organization, your formal rank, is affecting how you view the network. This is what we're interested in, and we're going to make the argument that, hey, you know, managers need to know what's going on within the network to be able to get stuff done. So our main question is, does your formal power, your formal rank in the organization relate to network accuracy. Most of the work has been 
to this point in the opposite direction. Being more accurate makes you more powerful. Here we're going to say, what, where are you in the hierarchy and how does that relate to accuracy? And if you go back to the previous research that's been done, um, the idea is that if you're in a higher rank position, then uh, you're actually not very good at seeing the network. And it leads to more errors in perception rather than uh, fewer. So the bottom line that we've gotten to this point is that somebody who's higher up in the organization is a cognitive miser, they're doing other stuff, they're not paying attention to the network. And Josh and I, having worked for a long period of time before coming into academia, just said, you know what, this doesn't match up with the people that we know that are managers. They're very acutely aware of what's going on with this network. In fact, you might argue that they should know more. So let's go in and let's see what's going on. Uh, we've taken a different route. We've gone down the road of saying, let's go into uh, some of the social site work that's been going on on the situated focus theory of power. And what we're going to do is say that once somebody is in a position of power, this is going to affect uh, how they process the world, perceive the world around them, and that powerful individuals, it's not that they're cognitive misers, it's just that they are allocating their attention differently than folks who are not in powerful positions. So we're going to argue that managers are flexible in where they put their attention and they focus on different things than people who are lower in the organization. And what we're going to do is, rather than just look, for example, where most of this research has been, which has been on uh, friendship, uh, so an affective relationship that is very positive, we're going to say, look, you know, a lot of times what managers need to know is, can I put people together to get something done? So one of the things they're going to need to know is, do they trust each other? in terms of their task, being able to get stuff done. Maybe even more importantly, do I know that these two people <coughs> distrust each other? And maybe even more importantly than that, not only do they maybe distrust each other at a task instrumental level, but they dislike each other. So they really can't get anything done. They've got relationship conflict in this situation. And so I need to be paying attention to these kinds of relationships rather than worrying about who's friends with whom. So the main research question then is, is this managerial rank within these kinds of production groups related to social network accuracy in these four types of networks? And we're going to say that based on previous evidence, managers are not going to be paying attention to the friendship network. They're going to be inaccurate there. But they're going to be more accurate in these other networks that matter more, given what they're trying to do. So we did this research in a, a division of a European-based manufacturer that's actually in uh, the southeast. If you go into McDonald's and order a latte, uh, you've used, you've seen their machines. They make those machines that make the espresso and the lattes. And the group that we went into was the technical call center. So uh, what you got is that those machines break down. And when they break down, uh, the person who's standing there hitting the button has to figure out, what do I do now? And they call into the call center. And the call center has multiple groups. And what they're doing is fielding sometimes very simple questions and taking somebody through processes like, well, unplug the machine, replug it. Most of the time, though, the questions are much more complex. Uh, so there'll already be a service technician out there, and they're trying to figure out why this machine isn't working. And you have these folks who are in the call center back in Tennessee, where this was taking place. And they've got pieces of this machine uh, in lots of bits. And they're trying together 
to figure out how do we make it work? What is this person telling me? How do we solve this problem? So there's a great deal of interdependence uh, within these groups. Uh, highly trained individuals, very technical work. What we did was that we collected cognitive social structure data from uh, 39 out of the 42 people who were in these two work groups. So cognitive social structure data, for those who don't know, I mean, it's a, it's a pretty straightforward but annoying task that I'll share with you uh, in greater depth. What you're doing is you're asking somebody, okay, tell us who your friends are, who you dislike, who you trust in terms of the task, who you distrust. And then we say, okay, now, do the same thing for Steve. Do the same thing for Nash. Who do they trust? Who do they distrust? So you're doing it for every person within the group. Yeah, it's extremely painful. Um, and they're doing it within each of their groups. So one of the groups had 25 individuals, the other one 17. And you can see already that this would be a huge task for somebody to do. And uh, can I ask a question? Is that funny yeah. a single seating with each person? Yes. I'm going to show you what we did. But yeah, it's. It's painful. What we did was that we collected. I that things would become less accurate than that kind of. Yeah, yeah. So what we did was that we collected their own. Sorry, their own person. I'm Italian, so I have to talk with my hands. <laughs> uh, we collected their own personal networks at one point in time, and then went back and had them do everybody else's networks at another time. We had the uh, the luck of having lots and lots of time to be there. So Josh was there for three weeks embedded within the organization. Uh, so we were able to do that. But when they're actually answering these questions, it was a 40 minute task. So it wasn't a short task. Now they were only doing this within their group. So again, 25 people answering about the other 24 people's connections. But still, that's a huge huge task to take on. And uh, let me give you a, a sense of the setting, because I think this is kind of important. Um, it's an open area. There's uh, just no, this is sort of, this is exactly what it looks like. Here's the pictures. So this is where group one is sitting. This is where group two is sitting. And it's all open uh, to each other. Uh, because at any moment I may need to, as I'm sitting there trying to solve this problem, I may, I may need to pick up and run over to somebody else and say, hey, help me with this. And uh, Josh, we parked him here for three weeks just sitting there watching what was going on. And you would imagine in this very open area that you can actually see the network. And so you would imagine that people would be very accurate in this. What I'm going to show you is that they're not, uh, even with all that openness to what's going on within uh, this setting. Another thing that's kind of interesting that you'll need to know about is that you know folks will work here for eight hours, but eight hours may not be enough to figure out what's wrong with this machine. And so there's a handoff between shifts. They've got shifts running 24 hours uh, because McDonald's is open. 24 hours. So uh, you have to know that I've got what's called an open ticket. And they will actually send that open ticket to somebody else. And one of the big things that they're constantly doing is thinking about, who do I trust can get this done? And similarly, who do I distrust can't get it done? So there's a lot of that going on within these groups. Uh, this is the task that those poor respondents had in front of them. This is how we collected the CSS, which was uh, uh, through answering these matrices. And this is a, a vision test. I'm sure you can all see it. So I'm going to just get in a little closer. Uh, we took the affective questions and the instrumental questions, and we uh, did each of them on their own separate matrix. And literally, the person is writing in uh, all the names of the people in their group. And then uh, 
that same set of names is across, and then they have to decide, is this a personal friend or do you dislike the person? And then you're doing it for Notch. Who's his personal friends? Who does he dislike? And you do it for Dorothy, and you do it for everybody within your group. And you're just filling in this matrix. So how do we determine if somebody is accurate? We're using uh, the Chicard index here. And it's a simple approach. You've got ego's perception of the network is A. Uh, B is that true network. And then the intersection of the two we're going to look at as uh, being the accurate network. And as I said, this actual network is uh, we did it two <laughs> different ways. We use that row-dominated LAS, which is I ask Andrea, who are your friends? If she tells me that somebody's a friend, then I agree. And then we also did it with uh, uh, Butts' approach, the Bayesian network accuracy model, where we're using uh, the probabilities based on everybody's responses. Uh, neither way is perfect. Each has their own assumptions. Uh, but anyway, we did it both ways. The Buttsian approach is what I call this. And um, I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, if, if somebody didn't know, what would they do? If I didn't know if somebody would, if I didn't know the relation or what I was doing, what what would I put in? Blank. Like you can leave it blank. Absolutely. Yeah, you so would you see. would leave it blank. Uh -huh. And uh, you know we would be calculating uh, if if you leave it blank, you're implying that they, they, they don't, that they they don't, they don't trust. Know. That's different from a don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate the problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's analysis, right, yeah. That's so right, yeah. I'm, I'd be curious to get how you yeah. handle that distinction. Yeah. yeah. So um, with the Jacquard index, if somebody is saying, I trust this other person, then if somebody didn't uh, put that, then you have uh, an inaccuracy there. But it's only relative to the, uh, the ties that appear there. That's how we were handling it. The blank type could be interpreted as a not trust versus a I don't know. Yes, that is. Oh, oh, okay. yeah. That's but a don't problem. you pick up the distrust yeah. matrix? So, yeah. huh? Don't you have a distrust matrix? So it's just like we have a distrust matrix, but that that's different than um, you know. There's no. I don't have an opinion either way. You you have, you have dislike and like and don't know or is the the friendship is not is the that best. strong. Yeah. So again, uh, the actual network is a collection of everybody's view of uh, the network. And just to give you a sense of what's going on, so again, the question we asked there, who you considered to be a friend, the average density of that network was 24%. Uh, dislike, as you would imagine, is much uh, less dense, 3% in line with what we tend to find with negative tie research. On the task trust, who you can uh, trust or distrust to complete a task, 36% um, density and 5% density for the task distrust. Yes. Did you, uh, when you guys debated this instrument, did you sort of, I mean, this is more like a GSS type of an approach, right? Versus the roster directly, and then uh, what, what was your, well, why did you go towards this direction? Uh, so, so to doing the the CSS, yeah. the, CSS yeah. the way we did it with that matrix, right. um, we had looked into how uh, how Cracker had done his originally, right. and it was just going to take so much effort uh, for the respondents, and we wanted to collect four matrices uh, as opposed to one or two, and so it was really more just to keep it so that the respondents didn't go out of their minds. I mean, we had pre-tested it, and this is kind of still a roster, though, because it's like mm -hmm. yeah. how many people are in the group and they're answering about everything. So it's, it's, it's not square. a square roster. It's not a GSS. Yeah, it's not the GSS. So uh, the first set of um, analyses we're going to do on the whole network. So we're going to uh, take out uh, ego's own perception of their own network. Where is And, uh, and then we're going to look and see how accurate they are. And what you're going to find is that they're extremely inaccurate. Uh, so this is, that's how accurate 
they are across all of these networks and they're terrible at the task. We're going to control for lots and lots of stuff. Um, I'm not going to go through this. And we'll take a GLM approach. And the upshot is going to be uh, <coughs> basically that managers are no different than non-managers on most things except on the negative ties, on the dislike ties. That's where they're really good. They can pick out who dislikes somebody else. Um, you know, some, some of the things that we heard from them. Both are fantastic guys, but together they're tough to tame. So they're going to sit there and argue, yet they're talking about the same thing. And so I'm cautious about having those people in an event together. So clearly they're watching what's going on. It's just that their attention is somewhere else. We also did the dyadic level analysis. So uh, a person's perception of their own incoming ties and uh, how, how good they are at seeing that. And we would expect that if this situated cognition uh, point of view is correct, that the managers should be very accurate about their own subordinates' ties. They should care about what other people think about their subordinates. And in fact, they are uh, very accurate about their own subordinates' ties. Uh, so they are paying very close attention. They may not be paying close attention about everybody in the network, but the people that affect their ability to get something done, these are the ones that um, they're paying attention to. And incidentally, it's also true that subordinates are paying very close attention to the manager's ties. Makes sense. And then the perceptions of their own ties. Uh, how, how accurate are they about their own ties? And it turns out that managers are very accurate about their own incoming ties, much more so than non-managers. And this was true for uh, who they felt disliked them, who trusted them in terms of their work, as well as who distrusted them. So um, the only one that they weren't more accurate about was the friendship ties. That's the one that uh, people have been studying in the past. And it's the least important think about it. So uh, what does this look like? Well, taken together, what I would suggest is that you know managers are paying attention. And really, what they're paying attention to, I think, is much more the political ground of what's going on within the organization. They're looking <coughs> at um, how people are viewing them, how people are viewing their subordinates. And they're looking at the part of uh, the relational world where things could make me get into a bump in the road when I'm trying to get something done, right? So I would suggest that, hey, they're just more politically attuned. So these people are not cognitive misers. It also suggests that you know, the situated focus theory of cognition, by just look at the name, it's kind of a cold cognitive theory. And really what we should be thinking about is that managers are being pulled towards uh, affective elements, and particularly those that have negative aspects to it. So it's this negative uh, asymmetry, negative primacy. That's where um, they care about most. So they're politically astute students of the network. And just to wrap up, I think that you can see that there would be all kinds of implications that you can begin to think about. Uh, you know, where is knowledge held within the group? could do the same sort of approach. How much do you trust that person's knowledge? How willing is the person to share that knowledge with you or others, both for those instrumental or affective reasons? And does power affect uh, knowledge perception and flow? Uh, so one of the things that um, I didn't talk about in here, I began this with sort of uh, a manager uh, who is trying to get stuff done needs to know about what's going on in the network. One of the things we were interested in is what happens to people over time. So we collected these data initially last year. And we've been following what ended up happening to these folks over time. Uh, and it turns out that your accuracy, especially on the negative side, tends to lead you to getting promoted. 
So if you were a group one person, you get promoted to group two. If you're a group two person, you get promoted out of that group and into different other parts of the organization. So uh, not only does power affect your accuracy, but then your accuracy drives your future power. OK. No, I really want those who have lots of time. I got to stay on time. I'm sorry. I thought I had 45 minutes when we began. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, very interesting presentation. A Thank couple you. of uh, questions um, and thoughts. Um, you, 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 uh, did you look at, or if you didn't, um, what would you think about managers at different levels? So there's a direct supervisor, middle level managers, and executives. How might that change some of your thoughts on this? Actually, I'm not sure that it would change my thoughts, given uh, I'm talking to executives. It seems to me that they're even more politically astute, even more attuned to. So might there might there be a difference by level in terms of accuracy? That's what I'm basically asking. I think so. I don't know. Now, I want to I want to offset though and say that the social complexity of the environment is much higher as you move up the organization, so they're gonna have much more social information to try to code. So I'm not sure which will come out, so I just wanna get your thoughts on that one. No, I, a couple I, follow up. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, I, I do believe that it would be even more difficult and they're even more attuned at a higher level. Uh, how you would actually test that, I have no idea. It was hard enough to just yeah. do it at yeah. this low level. Um, and I, I have not figured that one out. Josh, I know, is working really hard to try and think about that. One of the interesting things is to look at the middle-level managers' perceptions of their managers' social networks. Yes. And that, because that would be fascinating. Um, which, which also, if you think about it, if you're in the middle, you're probably paying very close attention to who's above you, yeah. but also you have to be paying close attention to who's below you. So their cognitive uh, load is going to be the highest. Um, I would guess. I, I will say that um, the middle-level managers are also managing managers. That's why their perception of their managers below them in social networks would be interesting. One quick more question. You measured political intelligence, I think, and self-monitoring, and you left them as control variables. Did you find any association between those two variables and the uh, degree of accuracy? No. Yeah, that's a good question. And that's actually, so I didn't have a chance to. Uh, we did include some uh, attribute data so uh, their self-reported political skills, uh, the PANIS scale, the self-monitoring, need for achievement, need for affiliation, we couldn't find any so far. Uh, but I'm a structuralist, so I tend to just go, eh, there's nothing there, and then I move on. Uh, I, only, well, I only include these because uh, you know, other folks force me to, but I will. I promise that we'll keep looking to see if maybe there's something more there. Okay. Yeah. Question here. Yeah. Uh, really uh, interesting, interesting paper uh, for for a number of reasons, but in particular, uh, I'm really interested in the way you've introduced uh, negative ties as something as part of the cognitive representation, which I think is an area that's needs a lot more, more attention. Uh, Amen. And, and one of the things that occurred to me about that as I was listening to it was I was thinking about the, this paper that was published in Nature uh, recently on the cognitive mechanisms that people were using uh, to reduce the cognitive load in the representation of a network. And, and one of those is this compression <coughs> heuristic uh, in which we basically convert the network into an affiliation network. Um, and so we don't actually remember the edge list. Uh, we convert it into a bipartite network and we just remember the affiliations, which then causes us to fill in some triads that are actually open. Uh, that was the basic result. And then I was thinking how, you know, that has some implications for the cognitive load of these managers and these high positions. Because they can chunk. And also the way you were asking the question was really targeting, it was really inviting affiliation because it was task group. So who's on a task group together? Uh, 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 potentially, well, they're all together. but in the, but really the question, yeah, they're all together. Yeah. So, but so I guess my question really is whether so negative ties. It's I think may be much less uh, amenable to this heuristic of of, of 
of attaching labels, to, of shared mm -hmm. label. To <coughs> um, and I'm wondering if that might be some, so I guess I'm really asking you about what do you think is the cognitive mechanism that people are using? Are they, are they, are they using this affiliation heuristic or are they just memorizing edge lists? I don't know. That's a really good question. I, I, I need to explore that. I haven't done that to this point. But I will go down that path. Yeah, Woody, do you want to help me out on this one? <laughs> well, it would be great to hear, you didn't mention at all the uh, field work. Um, and one might have looked to the qualitative, you know, the ethnography to have some sense of this. It sounds like your managers thought of distrust as minefields, so there are things to be avoided. Friendship is fertile ground, and they just hoped things would get planted there, and they didn't pay all that close attention to it. Um, and so, you know, does that fit the? So, but uh, I guess when I was hearing your question, I immediately ran back to because I, I, while Josh was there for three weeks, I was there for a good chunk of time. Uh, I spent a few days in there. They had a, informal groups, and so there could have been chunking in that way. Uh, and some of those informal groups, for example, there was a, a crew that all had served in various forms of the military. Uh, we Did have you find that they would close triads that were actually open? Because that was the key finding mm -hmm. of this major paper. That, right. That right. Michael, we need to use the mic. The <clears throat> mic. You, you could have tried the community detection, right, to see if there were, just by looking at the links, if there were groups or blocks. Mm -hmm. uh, that would give you an idea also. Mm -hmm. Then you could test also yeah. if there are a preponderance of uh, negative links across from one group to another. Right, so then we would know if um, the task distrust or the negative ties are going across groups rather at the individual level. Okay, yeah. So I, I want to chime in here because there's a bias here, of, I'm sorry, Luis. Uh, uh, there's a bias here about thinking that this data, the you know, way Michael present this is that we're getting incorrect data because people are chunking and creating these triangles, et cetera. But I think part of the premise of the cognitive social structure literature, going back to David Crackhut, is that what actually matters is not what the real, quote unquote, real ground truth network is, but what people's perceptions are. So we have to sort of keep in mind that the, there's a figure ground issue here that we shouldn't be privileging what is the actual network, which we started discussing at the start, and then assuming that this could be an error, where in fact, in, many network theorists will say that what matters is not what actually happens, but what people's perceptions are of it. Well, both matter. Both matter, both matter right. So, but I just I want to make sure we don't sort of think of this sure. as flawed for that reason. I, I'm agreeing with you. What I mean is that if, if, he know, if he assumes that there are these blocks, and that people are, are doing this course training, then you can predict what kind of errors people are going to make, right? Because they just assume, okay, everybody in this block is at least friends, or at least there are no dislikes, or something like that. So you could use that as a sort of model to, to, to see what kind of predictions you'd get from the individuals in terms of, of, of doing that. Anyway, we have... Uh, yes, I had another question about true network. So like, in the beginning, you showed like the most accurate and least accurate uh, response, and like for the least accurate one, the, the person was missing a bunch of edges from himself to everybody, and then the true one, like he was actually connected to a bunch of people. So I'm wondering, like, and I guess this is because a lot of people thought he was friends with a bunch of them, and he, but he didn't. So I'm wondering what you think about like, uh, what does that say about like the definition of the true network, and uh, in particular when you are connected to a bunch of people in the true network, but you don't think you are. Is this because of the definition of friendship, the trust that each person has? Or, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a tough one, and this gets into this issue of do we, do we just focus on what you might tell us, that I'm only friends with these, these three people, or everybody else is watching you and saying, ah, you know, we think that he's friends with all these people. What is, what is the true network? Uh, we, Tried to be agnostic about that and just said, okay, let's do it both ways and see what happens. Um, personally, I think that the approach where you're asking the person to reveal how they feel and however they define friend is, is the one that's most important because ultimately they're the ones that are going to be um, acting. Uh, but on the other hand, if you're, if you're thinking about what is a manager doing, if they perceive that you're friends with somebody else, 
uh, or that that other person trusts your work, even if that's not true, they may put you together uh, within a group. And they were constantly having to form small groups to do various tasks. So I don't know what the, <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know what the answer is. I don't think there is a right answer. So recently I've become really unhappy with the word friend because it means so much to, to different things yeah. to everybody. And it's also something people use casually and with Facebook. And those are just not the same thing. But what I've begun doing is asking people functional questions. You know, uh, would you loan this person your car? Uh, would you lie for them? So yeah. there's a whole list of functional things. Like, what do you call a friend of that? Here, it has a functional consequence. And and uh, I mean, that strikes me as a really interesting area. What what do you mean, friend? Right? How about yeah. all of these different functional consequences? And if, if I know that these relationships are ones that involve a certain level of trust and willingness to share, and those are a certain level yeah. of watching somebody's back. And we've done this different ways in different organizations. We're doing this right now, where you know we've focused on the intimacy aspect. Uh, so. Who would you reveal personally sensitive information to? Uh, in a different setting, it might be uh, who would you go out with outside of work? So we've done it different ways. Uh, and we, we pre-tested and decided that in this setting, we were going to go with a general, vague way of doing it and let everybody just answer for themselves who they felt uh, their friends were. But I agree with you. Um, I don't know. So I want to go back to the question. Um, Joe, you, you actually controlled for the local CSS density. Yes. Um, the reason why I'm asking that is there's a paper by Kildoff and Crackhart which, in, in which they basically reported that accuracy in your immediate network, you tend to overestimate closure in triads and underestimate uh, closure. In, in, it's an inverted U is what they found. So did you find the same thing for CSS? For the, Local density? I don't remember. I don't think. Because that sort of addresses the chunking question that was raised before. That, yes, uh, people may have a bias based on their, you know, whether people are in the immediate network versus not. And maybe the CS, the local density may have found. If you come up afterwards, I can, yeah. I can look at the paper. I can't remember. All right, so I want to go back to the question about which of the kinds of matrices would you would want to use, or which, what's truth, ground truth. And wouldn't that depend on what you're trying to predict? So if I'm trying to predict my behavior, then it seems to me that my <laughs> perception of the network yeah. is what's going to be more predictive of my behavior. But if you want to predict collectively what happens, then I think most people's perceptions about what you and I are friends or not friends is going to predict that more now, accurately. So level. here's a question I have for you all. Uh, obviously, one of the things we're heading in this next direction is we want to predict whether you get promoted. and which should we Collective. use? Or your manager, the people who are going to influence that decision. Yeah, but, but from my perspective, if I am accurate about the network, then I can act within the network better, and then maybe people will notice me and want to promote me. Yes, but you could also be wrong, and therefore your acts don't translate in the way that you want them to. Okay. On right. average, what happens is another question. structural hall, some being black and some being white. So, so I wonder the same thing about like whether the accuracy, you know, you don't have a, it depends on the question, you're interested in the farm, you different. So if it is something, for example, who's my friend, so I think the local address structure is a better one because I know better who is my friend. But if you're talking about different network, for example, who is an expert in something, that may be like, well, you know, the consensus, we better judge them for everything. So, uh, to me, it's like yeah. Yeah. I noticed that we steered you know, really clear of that kind of question. Um, you know, we were only asking things about 
you know, who do you trust or who do you like or dislike, rather than who is an expert in this topic. Uh, so. Yeah, so to me, I wonder whether the bar would be different. The, you know, the, what, what would be considered as an expert network? It depends on the question. Yeah, I think it's easier if you're just asking, you know, who's an expert in this, then I can aggregate everybody's uh, perception of some person's um, expertise and give them that score. That's a pretty straightforward thing to do. Final. Joe, this Save the best for last, right, Ron? <laughs> no, no. Uh, this question doesn't come up as so often with journal reviews. It comes up in tenure letters um, more often. Mm -hmm. um, and the question is how to frame uh, truth. So it, it's the question that came up over there and the, the, the question that, that you how have brought up. How to frame truth? True. In the sense that true. because David Krakart first did this, he used the <coughs> average as accurate. Everyone sees this accurately. Uh, and people in the center tend to see the average. Now, if you code that as accurate, then people at the center have an advantage. But if you code it as stereotypical, you yeah. can still get promoted because you're beating up on people by the stereotypes of the relationship. But if you're after their relationships, then in fact, managers only know the stereotypical organization, not the real organization. Yeah. That may or may not be useful. But what's your frame on this? Because those are two very yeah, different no, that's, frames. That's, um, that's something that we've actually, we, we were looking at in a, in a different um, paper, not, not necessarily in terms of network perception, but looking at how uh, stereotypical somebody's network was versus how unique. Um, so what you're saying is let's separate out um, that, that portion of the network that's unique and then uh, focus in there to see the relative accuracy that people have. I, I, I would avoid the word accurate. I, I think close to the stereotype or away from the second okay, or away from the, the stereotype. And then I look for an instrument for this is a pedestrian, boring person. And he's seeing things stereotypically. And in some firms, that's a plus. But, but, and in other firms, you miss the innovative piece that people put together. Yeah. So it's kind of good. going back to like what Brian was doing. Very much. Very much. Thank you. One more? Oh, there's one more person. I'll give you this and you can punt it to you whoever. You speak much louder. Get the microphone. Uh, I'll, I'll give you this question, Joe, and punt it to whoever comes after you, uh, because it's going to be a generic one for, uh, I'm going to ask. How do we do this without asking surveys? Mm -hmm. How do we? How do we? I make, knew the answer to that question. Do you think that we would have done this? But we, <laughs> have, we have to get. But we have to get there. So how do we get there? If you've got them in this room, can we videotape them? Can we look at behavioral indices? All right. What kinds of things can we do where we can capture this without having to answer the survey? That's Maybe the, I go into email data and I look at a thread and I see that uh, originally certain people were cc'd in. And then all of a sudden, later, more people ended up being cc'd in or dropped out of the thread. And so we can start to look at that as potential inaccuracies. I don't know. I don't know the answer. If I knew, so, I would have. So what we've done, we built things, instrument packages, to be able to measure actual behavior without any subjective bias. And we do it with phones. And what you find is you can reproduce these things by taking the sensor measurements. And you can do a really good job. You can do you know, sort of 80 to 90 percent of, of however you want to define that. I can tell you what that means in terms of sensor measurements. Uh, and, and that means now that I can handle a larger population for longer periods of time. And uh, you get to choose what you mean, right? Because you get to ask some questions and then you calibrate this. And now it, and, and I offer so one I, suggestion. I know that this is a fascinating discussion. <laughs> no, no, we can yeah, yeah, be ruthless right. and keep us on schedule. I would like us all to thank Joe. Yeah. 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 Yeah.